It is 2023. It is the Scramble Podcast, and we are off to the races. Chris Flynn in beautiful Quebec, um, close-ish to Ottawa. Paul Hollingsworth in Dartmouth on the Dartmouth side of Halifax Harbor. Chris, hello to you, and Happy New Year. Yeah, Happy New Year to, to you too, Paul. You've had a couple of exciting evenings in Halifax lately, I think, down, down at the yeah, arena. <laughs> yeah, the World Junior Hockey Championship is a wrap. It was a success. We'll talk about that in a moment, but basically... Moncton and Halifax should be proud. The Canadian juniors win gold medal. Uh, and I was also running back and forth to Toronto, anchoring Sports Center while the World Juniors were going on. So it was a busy holiday season, but a productive holiday season. And I know it was for you too. So listen, we have a laundry list of things to go through. We are going to start doing these regularly now in 2023, as we talked about. We will have guests going forward. Wanted to tee this one up um, heading into the weekend. We were going to do one the last two nights. We should tell our listeners, Chris. But we bumped into several things, breaking news in the NFL, which we wanted to let that play out. And the World Junior Hockey Championship, the semifinal and the final games were happening. And we didn't want to lay down a podcast and have it be dated within five hours. And with the with the outcome already settled, we'll be talking about it as it, as it hadn't happened yet. So that's the reason why. So on this Friday night, we're dropping this episode. Uh, let's start with the World Juniors. First of all, before I go inside the venue and tell you what it was like, um, your perspective was what? How much did you watch? What did you think of the action? Oh, I watched most of the games, especially the all the, the playoff games. And I can relate a little bit to what it's like playing in front of Halifax crowds. And wow, it was amazing. The players were talking about it. The commentators were talking about it, how, how the fans were behind the team. Shane Wright was saying it was the most incredible crowd he had ever played in front of. That was the kind of feedback you got watching you know, at home on television. As I said, I can relate to what it was like playing in front of those kinds of crowds in Halifax. That's what Halifax is like, Moncton as well. Even when it wasn't Canada playing, even the, the bronze medal game, U.S. and Sweden was, I think, a jam-packed house, and that was like a really high-scoring game. So Halifax and Moncton did an amazing job. And this is me watching from Quebec, but I know you were at uh, the gold medal game. What was it like in the arena? Uh, beyond description. So as some context, some layered context, uh, the Metro Center, now called Scotia Bank Center, opened in 1978. I think I was there the very first night for an American Hockey League game. So I grew up going to the Metro Center slash Scotia Bank Center. And I, I go with my dad and my brother, and I wouldn't even want to count how many times I've been there. The Nova Scotia Voyageurs, when they played there, we get 3,000 people a game. It was a great environment, but it was 3,000 people a game. They're replaced by the Nova Scotia Oilers, then the Halifax Citadels. Again, three, 4,000 fans a game. The Mooseheads came to town. They changed the dynamic, and they became six, seven, eight thousand, 8,000, sometimes 10,000 fans a game. So I grew up conditioned to not seeing a lot of exciting moments at the Metro Center. That changed with the advent of the Mooseheads, and then the 2003 World Juniors came. And I remember, Chris, watching that tournament saying, I never thought a Halifax hockey crowd would ever behave like this. I knew we saw football or basketball crowds be very raucous. But I I was pleasantly surprised to see how they were so into it 20 years ago. And then this event happens. And I was there. Um, I was there. I was in the building three times. because I was, As I mentioned earlier, I was in Toronto a lot, anchoring Sports Center. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, James Duffy, who works for TSN, was – hosting in Halifax, throwing to Sports Center when the World Juniors were done for the night. And here's Paul Hollingsworth with Sports Center. And I was in Toronto where I live in Halifax. It was a yeah. weird sort of geograph geographical <laughs> thing. That's the world I live in. So I was, but I was there to return to the story. I was there on Monday night for most of the game. I, I had been away all weekend and I was really tired. So I, I didn't last through the whole game. I had, I had to go home and um, because I was working early the next morning. And then I was there in the daytime for a little bit of the Sweden Czechia semifinal, and then all of the Can Canada semifinal versus the U.S., and then all of the final versus Czechia. It was loud. Uh, I don't measure decibel meters, but it was like ear stingingly loud. The building was vibrating. Like it felt like the place was going to come down. Really, really cool moment when they scored that overtime goal last night. You have in your mind's eye, as you do, Chris, as an athlete, probably three or four moments that stand out. And you say, okay, this moment in time, says Chris Lynn, 
I'm going to hang on to this memory forever. For me as a fan, not a participant, as a journalist, not a participant, I walked out of there last night saying, that is a moment when my time has passed and they talk about the experiences I've had. I want them to mention that night because it was just wild. Yeah, Canada won a gold medal and yeah, I was there to see it. But just to be around a crowd that was that off the hook was so fun. So happy for the city, so happy for the players and so happy that the World Juniors with all the pandemic stuff that's gone on the past two years is back on track. And Halifax and Moncton were the cities that put it back on track. Yeah, and they didn't even have like the full amount of time to prepare for it as a host city normally would have so they did an incredible job too as you said as as did uh, Moncton and again from watching on television and just even the comments on social media too was just incredible and all of course it was about Team Canada but it was also about the the crowd the fans Mm -hmm. like in Halifax it was like you know it did remind you of like you know Sidney Crosby's goal in the in the olympics in in vancouver except that was the olympics you know that that's a worldwide thing or at the at the at the highest level this was junior hockey yet just the way the way halifax followed the team the whole tournament not just the the gold medal game but the entire tournament and of course tsn did an amazing job too of covering uh covering all the entire event too so from watching it back home on my couch it was it was an incredible feeling for me, and I couldn't imagine being at the game. It was uh, pretty awesome to watch. And a couple of a couple of statistics to throw at people: uh, Halifax was ninety eight percent capacity for all the games. Moncton was seventy four percent capacity. That's without any Canada games there for the regular right. tournament games. Mm-hmm. So Halifax was close to one hundred percent for Sweden versus Czechia, the semifinal. There were nine thousand two hundred sixty eight people, I think, in the building watching those two teams play. Unbelievable. I think for the relegation game to determine who would not make it to the World Juniors next year, I believe there were six or 7,000 people in the building. Unbelievable. Another figure to throw at you, Chris, is um, $45 million for the financial impact for the spinoffs for the city of Halifax. Midtown Tavern last night, a place you know well. People were lined up as far as you could see them at one in the morning on a Thursday night. It was packed everywhere. Restaurants, hotels, pubs, bars, sandwich cafes, you name it. Everybody was making a nickel off of this. And I was very happy for them because like your community, like my community with the, with the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of businesses, businesses went through a lot of hard times in recent years, especially the hospitality industry. And it was really nice to see a sports tourism event in the wintertime come and really inject some positivity into the marketplace. Absolutely. The commentators were mentioning that too. Everywhere you go, went around town people were talking about the game and the tournament it was like it was amazing and i would imagine those i was thinking of the players not just for canada but for all the countries some of those players maybe don't play in front of big crowds like you Mm -hmm. said even the you know czechia playing uh you know austria or whoever uh, all all the games got big crowds and i'm sure the players and from those teams sure appreciated um as well and they they fully understand now what hockey in canada means <laughs> as well well yeah and, j- and just to finish our thoughts on the world juniors so canada wins their second straight world juniors as a 53 year old adult who has covered a lot of big sporting events i was in awe of it i can't imagine being an 18 year old european kid who's used to to your point playing in front of maybe two or three thousand max if they're lucky mm-hmm. and stepping into that zoo of an environment uh, really, really special event. I uh, want to pivot from that to some NFL. Uh, well, let's do it. Let's do a bit of a deeper dive. Um, the very sad situation in the, in the NFL this week sort of walk us through, you know, the Bills versus the Bengals. Our viewers, listeners probably know the whole story for now, but I'll let you start it off. Well, I was watching that game while I think Canada was playing in the quarterfinals, where it's kind of going back and forth to both games on Monday night. It was a huge game. You know, uh, Cincinnati against Buffalo, possibly two of the top five teams uh, in the NFL playing. So it was a very important game. There was a lot of people watching. And on the play itself, midway through the first quarter, it was pretty harmless tackle. Uh, DeMar Hamlin kind of tackled him, but he did kind of get hit right in the chest. And after he got hit, he jumped right up, even adjusted his face mask. And then, and then he just collapsed. It was the strangest thing. And as you know, in the NFL, man, it's it's uh, they don't stop for anything. Like like that's the first time a game has ever been 
suspended. Like guys get hurt all the time and the game keeps going. But in that situation, I guess he had lost consciousness and, and uh, like those players, those teammates were wondering, you know, is our teammate going to die right here on the field? Like it was that serious and that you could see the reaction. And, and I think he was on the field for like 19 or 20 minutes, but it was, uh, it was something that I've been in sports and football my whole life. Uh, like you and I've never seen anything like that. That's pretty well what everybody else was saying is they hadn't experienced anything like that. You could see the the fear in the players' faces on the field because they could see what was going on. They could see that he wasn't breathing and he was unconscious, and it was uh, it was pretty scary. the The good news uh, these few days later is he seems to be. Sp- I don't want to say recovering, but there's been some positive signs of mm-hmm. he FaceTime with his teammates uh, earlier today, I think, as well. So communicating with them. So he's showing some signs of improvement, which is uh, which is great to see. When they when they canceled the game, I, too, was surprised. Uh, y- you probably will agree they did the right thing. There was a lot of hand wringing. I saw Skip Bayless on his um, had a post out, and he wasn't questioning it so much, but he was thrown with the notion that it's an important game. Maybe they should consider playing. I don't want to miss. I don't want to mischaracterize his tweet, mm-hmm. but it wasn't quite definitive when it comes to what the outcome should be. I was pleased that they canceled the game or postponed the game because, in hindsight, it seems that it would be appalling to me to play the game. Uh, would you agree with that? Absolutely. Like I said, uh, football, the game goes on. It's a tough man sport, next man up kind of thing. Guys break legs and all kinds of things and are getting knocked out, but the game goes on. But in this particular case, the guy was, he, uh, Damar was unconscious and they were wondering if, you know, for for his life, they were fearing for his life. So it was um, a totally different situation. So uh, it yeah, it was they did the right thing and and then wondering what was going to go on as far as where they're going to when could they reschedule this game? Like there's no time left. The playoffs are, are next week. So I, I think I believe they've actually just called it a no contest and they will not be rescheduling it. Then there's a very convoluted um, method or however they're going to try to do this as far as figure out how the playoffs will happen and who's going to post what games but uh the good news all out of all of it is demar is is improving and and hopefully uh you know hopefully it's going to be okay you know i um i was trying to find comparables in my mind because we've all seen some scary things in sports mm-hmm. this one may surprise you and it may surprise our listeners the the incident i thought of when it happened different sport completely different play when max patcheretti was hit playing for the Montreal Canadiens by Zidane, by Zidane Chara, he went into the stanchion and he went sort of head first, neck first into it. And the wow. way he landed and didn't move, I, I was watching it live. I remember that. Yeah, And I remember thinking, Chris, I don't even like to speculate, in, even in hindsight, but I, but I remember fearing the absolute worst. I was like, that doesn't look right to me. And then when he moved, I was so relieved. And But I remember for... 60 seconds, 90 seconds, 120 seconds, I was watching, saying, am I watching the, you know, this ultimate tragedy unfold for during a sports event, which is supposed to be an escape from life? So that's the part that really alarmed me, that it, A, reminded me of a previous horrifying experience watching sports. A compl- again, a completely different situation, but also that it's a game. It's supposed to be fun. It's not supposed mm-hmm. to be life and death. It's not supposed to be this. Um, and it did sort of bring back a flood of memories for those sort of things. Um, by the way, I wanted to, to ask, have you seen anything in your playing career where you saw somebody experience something that had you fearing the worst? I mean, obviously not not a cardiac arrest necessarily to be resuscitated, but you played a sport where there's head and neck injuries, compound fractures. I mean, you must have seen, without being graphic, you must have experienced some things along the way where you're kind of thinking this is not going to have a happy outcome. Nothing like that, though. Just guys getting injured and uh, you know blowing their knees out and that kind of thing. And uh, but n- nothing like that where the guy's unconscious and they're giving him CPR and yeah. and you know you're worried for your teammate's life right there on the spot. No, I've never witnessed like that. Uh, you know, in person and even watching 
hundreds of games like everyone else, nothing quite to that uh, uh, extent uh, as, as what I watched and everyone else watched on Monday night. Well, we, we wish him the best. We also wish his family the best. And we hope he's taken care of. He's not vested from a pension standpoint for the NFL. He hasn't played long enough. He hasn't made a lot of money. Uh, maybe he's made money by our standards, but not enough money to take care of himself mm-hmm. for the rest of his life. So I hope things track well for him going forward, obviously. Uh, let's do a couple of quick quick hits there. Uh, National Football Championship, NCAA, your thoughts are what? Oh, just real quick, the 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 two semifinal games last weekend. Oh my God! Like Michigan, terrific, terrific. Yeah, yeah. against TCU, and then uh, Ohio Ohio State against uh, against Georgia. Wow, both it was two games in a row. Two of the two of the best games I've ever seen. It was it was unbelievable. So could I know Georgia's a big favorite. I think they're thirteen point favorites, and and they should win. But could could TCU win? Absolutely, they could win. Georgia gave up uh, over 40 points against Ohio State. So I know Georgia's the favorite. They'll probably win. But uh, could TCU win? Absolutely, they could. I think they have a – I forget what their their uh, attendance is at their school, but they're a, they're a much smaller school than the Georgias and the Michigans and the Ohio State. So kind of pulling for um, TCU it kind of reminds me of like say St. Mary's against Western once upon a time. So going to go for, uh, for TCU on, uh, on Monday night. Well, watching Ohio state versus Georgia last week, I found myself forgetting who was the favorite. I forgot. I found myself forgetting who was supposed to be the short-term perennial powerhouse here. Like that game was so compelling that the outcome was so hard to determine Five minutes before the broadcast ended, it was a real compelling drama to watch. And Ohio State could have won the game. I, I think was it a forty-eight yard or fifty-yard field goal at the end to to win it, but they they missed. So uh, it was an amazing game. The Michigan TCU game was just like it seemed like one seventy-yard touchdown after another. It was it was two awesome games, and uh, uh, hopefully the the final on Monday night on TSN will live up to it. And NFL happening this weekend. Um, that's true. A yeah. lot of scenarios in place when it comes to who will make the playoffs and where some teams will be seated. We don't want to get totally into that because we'll confuse the heck out of people because it confuses me. You almost want to look, wake up Monday morning and look at the standings. Um, Tom Brady going back to the postseason, kind of a cool story. Again, uh, how do you see the the playoff battle shaping up as we determine the final spots? And as you answer that question, maybe pivot into how you see the first wild card round going. Well, I'm looking forward to Saturday night game, Saturday night's game, Jacksonville against Tennessee. I think Jacksonville yeah. started one and six or one and seven. Now they have a chance to win the division. So I'd like to see them finish off this comeback they've had and, and win the division. And then for that last wild card spot, I think it's uh, Pittsburgh, New England, and the Dolphins all going for that last wild card spot. I think right. they're all eight and eight. So that's pretty interesting. Over on the other side, I think Sunday, Green Bay will play. Detroit and Green Bay hasn't made the turnaround as big as Jacksonville's, but I think they were four and eight. And now if Green Bay wins, they're in. If Detroit, Detroit needs to win and have Seattle That's lose right. as, as well. And I'd love to see Detroit win just because they never win. They never make the playoffs. Jared Gott got criticized so badly his first couple of years in Detroit, and they've had quite a turnaround too. So I kind of like to see Green Bay get into the playoffs but I also wouldn't mind seeing Detroit uh, get in there as well so seeing those basically three teams in the NFC uh, in the AFC and three teams in the NFC all vying for that that seventh playoff spot so uh, that'll that'll be fun and as you said there's all kinds of seedings like Philadelphia could finish first or maybe even third and there's Dallas in there and and uh, yeah old Tom Brady's back in the playoffs again to to make it interesting and so and if if Rodgers gets in if Green Bay gets in the playoffs I know they haven't done well in previous years when they were the number one seed but if he gets in as a wild card with no pressure on them kind of like he did about 10 or 12 years ago when they when they won the Super Bowl as that as that sixth seed he he I could see Green Bay doing something like that again if they make the playoffs, making a run scary. like they did. Yeah. yeah. Scary to play that team in the first round. Again, I'll make a comparison to different sports. A few years ago, uh, the Vancouver Canucks, I think, finished first in the Western Conference. Chicago snuck in and made it to eighth place. And so Vancouver got to play Chicago in the first round. Mm-hmm. And it was the worst possible draw because you knew 
where they were in the standings wasn't necessarily representative of how good of a team they were. Right. And they were a veteran team. They had a lot of stars. And that Green Bay team, I could just see them doing some damage. Um, let's talk a little bit of CFL. Uh, Touchdown Atlantic is coming back to your neck of the woods and my neck of the woods, Husky Stadium in Halifax. Now, before we get into this, ED University did a marvelous job hosting Touchdown Atlantic last year. Chris, that thing checked all the boxes. All the boxes. It was a beautiful sunny day. The, the venue looked great. They brought in a temporary stadium. They filled the building. You know the Halifax market. You know the Husky Stadium facility. Can they top that in Halifax? Or is that just going to be a continuation of what happened at Acadia last year? I think they're going to move the yeah they're going to move those stands into St. Mary's and try to get you know ten thousand fans there too. I hope to be there. I think it's July 29th. Yeah. I hope to be there for for that. That would be awesome to uh, to see. And just what we watch with the juniors, like it, it, you you feel like Halifax could definitely support a CFL team. Look what they just did as far as they supported the uh, you know the 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 junior championship. So I feel like. I guess it's a stadium. It's an issue with the stadium. You'd know more about that than than I would. But as far as the support, could they support a CFL team? Absolutely. Well, that game, I think that'll be an awesome game, as it was at Acadia. Watching it at home here, the uh, the game at Acadia was amazing. I think it'll look great at St. Mary's as well. It's just, um, what do they do for a stadium uh, moving forward? Do they do that with the same thing? Is 10,000 big enough? I don't think so for CFL games. No. So. Uh, cool. for a CFL team, I should say. So, um, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure it's at all to do with the stadium, I think. Eh? Yeah, well, I think what's going to happen is now I, I, when people hear what I'm about to say, I don't want people saying Hollingsworth says that this happens and this happens, they're going to get a CFL team. Here's a scenario that I see playing out for the CFL in Halifax to at least be a conversation for starters. I agree with you. I think the CFL would work in Halifax. I don't think it's a CFL conversation. It's a stadium conversation. Just like baseball returning to Montreal someday. I think Montreal can host can support baseball. But if you don't have a stadium, there's no conversation to have. It's the same thing with Halifax. So the Halifax Wanderers have a good thing going at the Wanderers grounds. There is a lot of talk that a project could be unveiled over the next year or two that would see the Wanderers grounds be turned into a permanent stadium. And I'm assuming it would be the two sides, 10, 12,000 fans. That's just a, a speculation. If that gets built and you're Randy Ambrosi, you're the CFL commissioner, you say, okay, now there's a stadium there. We can come in behind the end zones and put 5,000 seats behind it. And you get yourself a 17, 18, 19,000 seat stadium. You have a situation similar to what McGill has, a small, cozy, yes. boutique stadium. And then you can have a conversation then at least you can have a conversation. Then you can see if there is viable ownership. Do your marketplace studies. See if Halifax can support a CFL team. There are ways of determining it. But until they have the stadium issue settled, it's the never-ending story that never has an outcome to it. And I'm 40 years into, 40 years into this conversation, Chris, since they first thought of bringing the Atlantic schooners mm -hmm. here. And I'm not bored with the conversation in any disrespectful way, but it's time to get it done. And so until they solve the infrastructure piece, the CFL is a one game a year special event with, with uh, Touchdown Atlantic. And I hope they solve it going forward. But I agree with you. Can I see nine games at 18,000 fans a game, 20,000 fans a game with corporate support to help some of the other revenues? Yeah, I can see that working once they get the venue built. Yeah, and even a 15,000 seat mm -hmm. stadium overflowing yeah. will be very impressive compared to 30, 35,000 seat stadiums that are empty. Or even when I hate to say this, but when Toronto plays in Toronto, it's yeah. <laughs> their stadiums pretty empty. So, and plus they have nine teams. Halifax would make 10 teams. Like, yeah, you know, it's, and if you look at, um, you, you have experience being in Europe, the way some of the European stadiums are built, they almost have like neighborhoods inside of the stadiums. I went to, um, an LA Galaxy game in obviously Los Angeles. They were playing Kansas City and they have seating and areas and then flat area promenades where people stand and eat food and barbecue food. And so you, you have the stands going up and then you have this flat area 
that would be about two or three times the size of the footprint of the end zone at St. Mary's as sort of like a balcony landing. And there are hundreds of people there and it's standing room only, but there are stand up bars and stand up eating areas and they're watching the game over a railing. So there are ways to configure a stadium that doesn't have to be just 20,000 seats. To your point, you can get 15, 16, 17,000 seats and a functional standing room of four or 5,000 and it makes it a really nice environment. See, they yes. may have to think creatively out of the box. Yes, yeah, more. It makes it more impressive. Even our St. Mary's uh, playing in the Atlantic Bowls, whereas you know, ten thousand fans, but we it was this. What was it? A five thousand or six thousand right. stadium, but having an overflowing and standing room only around around the field. Like, yeah, they they could definitely figure something out. It doesn't have to be a twenty thousand seat stadium, or we can't have a team. You know, they could. Yeah. And hopefully they will they'll come up with something. But uh, seeing uh, seeing that game down at Acadia was uh, was very impressive last summer. Okay, let's wrap it up with this: the documentary that features you. Tell me about this. Tell our viewers about this. Walk us through the uh, the documentary project that um, you're quite proud of that was uh, that happened a while back. Okay, well it it features me, but it features our St. Mary's team, and it definitely features Coach. UTEC. So uh, Dale Stevens, who played basketball at St. Mary's right around that same time that that I was playing football there with Clarity Entertainment, decided to come up with this um, uh, documentary, kind of behind the scenes uh, uh, following St. Mary's during those years. Ryan Van Horn was kind of one of the directors or the director of of the documentary, and they decided to do um, Beyond the Game again, behind the scenes of during those those years uh, when I was playing there and. Amazingly enough, it was already eight years ago that they did it, 2015, but it was on East Link, and so our people in the Maritimes could see it, but the rest of Canada weren't really able to see it. But now it's available on uh, bingeable.ca uh, through YouTube on Bingeable. You can watch it there for free. And uh, it just kind of talks about me in there as well. When That's the years I played there, and, and a lot of interesting stuff about Coach Utech that people would like to know too. And and there's, I mean, they, they really did it well. They came here, they interviewed myself, my dad, they interviewed guys all across Canada, Matt Nealon and Jim Fitzsimmons, uh, um, Brian Hutchings. They interview a lot of the guys in Halifax, but it's very, very well done. They went behind the scenes. I'll give props to Carl Norton Jr. Who did a lot of that behind the scenes footage during those years. So it's pretty cool if you're a football fan or, you know, St. Mary's or even, from some of the other schools fan for either now or back then you'll you'll find it cool to kind of go back in time and and watch that documentary it's about an hour long so it's not it's not that long but it, uh you'll uh yeah check it out on bingeable.ca and uh, it's called beyond the game well i find too if you go on social media there's some sites that are dedicated to old sports videos and old sports pictures and i love looking at them i be, i'm, I'm a wash with memory so to have a documentary that delves into a subject that's near and dear to my heart and your heart, the St. Mary's Huskies, it, it, a, it preserves a very special chapter of that university slash football history, but it also does a nice job, job you know, shining the light of what are some really pleasant memories for, for people as well. Yeah. And like I say to people, our, we were pretty big back then and my name was well known back then. And a big reason for it was TSN. It's when TSN first came mm -hmm. out was kind of first time TSN was regular cable. And one of the things they decided to focus on was Canadian university football. And at that time was when our program was getting turned around and we were always ranked number one or two at that time. So as I tell people, we were like the Halifax Huskies back then. We were on TSN, you know, four or five times a, a year, it seemed like. So uh, it was, it was a big, it was big at that time. And it's pretty cool to kind of, you know, follow some of the behind the scenes uh, of what happened back then. And a lot of uh, cool information about coach Utech as well. And his, a little bit about his background too. He was a very good man. And uh, just to uh, finish the story on how big of a deal it was back then. Um, TSN would have highlights. They would cover St. Mary's football practices during the weekdays. <laughs> so you would watch sports center, what was called sports desk in those days at seven o'clock at night on a Tuesday or Wednesday night. And they'd have visuals from a St. Mary's practice and a clip from you looking ahead to the game that weekend. Like they have a Maple Leafs and Montreal Canadians and NFL football in their broadcast Absolutely. now. 
Yeah, you were on the front page when you played the Bishop's Gators in 1988, am I correct? Mm -hmm. 88 in the Atlantic Bowl. Mm -hmm. On the Thursday leading into the Atlantic Bowl, you were on the front page of the Montreal Gazette. There was It was a split page. There was you and whoever the star was for the Bishop's Gators in those days. But Leroy Blue. Leroy Blue. Yeah, Leroy That's Blue. right. Yeah. And yeah. the memory, it comes back. And it was a, not, not the front sports page, the front page. And people may forget that. And I think it's a fallen standard that we've moved away from that. I understand the NHL sucks up a lot of oxygen in our world. I understand the NFL is... The NFL owns one day of the week, basically now, a machine. and they yeah. they take up so much space. And so, if you're running a sports network, and look, I, I work for TSN, and I think they're simply outstanding, and they've made a big difference in my life. So I understand why they're programming the way they are now. Because if I ran the network, I would do the exact same thing. But I do think so. It's not a criticism of TSN at all. I just think there are so many platforms out there now that I hope one of them latches on and does a nice job elevating CIS football and CIS basketball and CIS hockey and give it the level of exposure it used to have because those are really good memories. Um, and look, TSN helped make your career. You were an excellent quarterback. You did great things. TSN made sure the whole country knew about it. And I imagine you're grateful to them because I always thought that was pretty cool to watch. Oh, even when Sports Desk came on, on a Saturday night, amazingly, the first thing they would show, believe it or not, is the highlights from our game earlier that day. Nowadays, the U Sport games probably won't even get mentioned the score, let alone showed highlights. But back at those days when I was playing, we were the first thing that came up. It's hard, it sounds hard to believe saying that, but that's TSN decided to focus on Kane University football at that time. So we were. Yeah, we were on there all the time. And they even did, you know, like the Heck Creighton Awards and all that, the, right. the awards show. They've televised all that too. And uh, and and being on the front page of newspapers across Canada was normal too. And that was because of the exposure from, from TSN. So if they could do something like that today, I know there's the market is very saturated for sure. But yeah. to try to get a little bit of... U sport football hockey and basketball uh on on the national stage again that would that would be great for sure it would be for sure well let us wrap it up there 2023 is underway we are starting to lay out some themes it is the scramble podcast with chris flynn i'm paul hollingsworth uh chris thank you for taking time in this friday night and we will post this and get ready to do more in the near future and as i mentioned before we are going to have guests and regular spots coming up um, a few things happen, including the Christmas holidays, but we are we are off to the races with this. I know you're excited about it, and so am I. Awesome. We'll uh, we'll talk again in a few days. It is the Scramble Podcast, and we thank everybody for listening and watching.